Great. Welcome to the first of DRK's Global Speakers Series entitled Perspectives, where we highlight incredible leaders who are making a real difference in the lives of others. When we thought of who would be our first speaker, Ruth J. Simmons came immediately to mind. Tonight, we will hear about Ruth's life, her leadership roles, and the amazing impact she's had on a, our education system and its role as a great equalizer. I'm Jim Bildner, CEO of Draper Richards Kaplan Foundation, or as it's known, DRK. I'll be your host for the next hour for a candid conversation with Ruth and Rob and what it takes to make a difference in the lives of others. Don't worry, we'll save plenty of time for your questions at the end. For those in the audience, uh, feel free to raise your hand or line up in front of the standing mics. For those live streaming, we'll be monitoring the chat room. We're joined today by DRK board member and co-chair Rob Kaplan. Rob served as the president and CEO of the Federal Reserve Bank of Dallas from 2015 until 2021. Previously, he served as the Martin Marshall Professor of Management Practice and a senior associate dean at Harvard Business School. And before that, he was vice chair of the Goldman Sachs Group with global responsibility for the firm's investment banking and investment management divisions. Rob and I have the distinct honor of introducing someone who believes education gave her her freedom. She's a visionary, a pioneer, and the first African-American woman to lead Brown University and Smith. Today, she's the eighth president of Prairie View A&M University, where we're coming live to you right now. Before we begin, I want to tell you a little bit more about your incredible president and our guest speaker today. Ruth J. Simmons was born in Grapeland, Texas, the youngest of 12 children. She credits her personal mantra from her mother, don't think of yourself as any better than anyone else. Ruth discovered in books at an early age that the world she lived in wasn't the reality of the world at all. For Ruth, education was magic. It taught her to be open-minded. It taught her to understand that the world's a very complex place. And it taught her to seek out and understand the different cultures of the world. It was her inquisitiveness that kept her in school, eventually earning her her master's and PhD from Harvard University. In 1996, she was hired as the first ever African-American woman president of Smith College, where she launched a number of important academic initiatives, including an engineering program, the first of its kind at a women's college. In 2001, she would go on to make history again, now as the first African-American president of an Ivy League school when she was inaugurated as the 18th president of Brown University. Simmons is a re recipient of so many honors. In fact, she's been awarded more honorary degrees and achievement medals than almost any other president of any university, a testament to her impact on the field and on her students. Ladies and gentlemen, Ruth J. Simmons. What an honor it is to have you. Rob, you. I turn the stage over to you for the DRK first of its series of perspectives. It's a pleasure to be here at Prairie View a and Welcome. Uh, thank you. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about your life and talk a little bit after that about your philosophy and then we'll take questions from the audience. Okay. But as Jim just said, you went from Grapeland, Texas <laughs> to Dillard University to Harvard and then ultimately a number of universities uh, uh, in California. Mike is not on? Okay, sorry. It is now. Okay, so can you hear me better now? So from Great Land, Texas, to uh, uh, Dillard University, then to Harvard, mm -hmm. and then ultimately to a number of universities, Princeton, uh, uh, and so on, and then eventually to Smith College, as we just heard, and then to Brown. For those in the audience, what did you have to, uh, what hurdles did you have to overcome or challenges you had to meet in order to make it from Grapeland to Harvard to these uh, leadership positions? How did that happen? Hmm. I think I'd say the greatest, uh, first of all, again, welcome. Um, thank you for coming to uh, Prairie View. Um, 
I would have to say that low expectations uh, was the greatest hurdle of all. Uh, beginning with um, being born in a very impoverished area in East Texas um, in deep segregation where it was understood that no black person had a right to do certain things, um, had the intelligence to achieve, um, had the wherewithal to be equal in society. And so I'm a product of pre-civil pre rights days in this country where there were no expectations for me and my family except that we would do very hard physical labor um, and meet the goals set by uh, people who had wealth. Um, and so coming through that was probably the most challenging. And it wasn't until, frankly, uh, moving into the realm of education that I came to understand that that wasn't really the reality everywhere. And uh, perhaps it didn't need to apply to me um, and to my family. And maybe I could begin to think differently about it. And I will never forget the first encounter I had with higher expectations was my first grade classroom. When I walked into that classroom, I can remember it today as if it were just yesterday. Uh, that classroom and the teacher in that classroom who welcomed me and made me feel as if I mattered somehow. And it was a shock to me huh. because I was the youngest of 12 children and I didn't matter at all in the household <laughs> that I came from. Yeah. And here was this woman saying, come in. She used to call us all baby. Come in, baby. Have a seat. Oh, you're so wonderful. Everything I did was wonderful. And I, of course, that was true. Yeah. But she said it was um, as if it was absolute fact that I was a wonder and a precious thing and that I could surely do wonderful things because there I was in her classroom yeah. doing wonderful things. And so I think that was the spark um, inevitably that made me think, well, maybe there's something special here in classrooms, in education, and maybe I can learn something, and maybe I can think differently about my life and what I can expect of my life. Because I thought I was supposed to be a field worker or a maid, right. um, and everybody that I knew uh, was, and so naturally I was going to follow in their footsteps. And was there a particular role model or role models that you look to growing up or say, I can be like that person? Not really, because when I left the farm, yeah. and then even through grade school and so forth, I, I didn't really know any people who had highfalutin jobs. Right. Um, uh, the, the highest uh, station in life that I could identify with were the teachers in my classes. Right. And they seemed, oh, extravagantly, extravagantly endowed yeah. with wealth and um, access to everything. Um, and I realized today that, of course, that wasn't true, but they seemed miraculous to me. Um, so I would say teachers um, played a big role in modeling for me what would be possible. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I had some extraordinary teachers. Um, extraordinary because um, you might not say that they were highly um, educated, but you would always say that they cared deeply about their students. Yes. And they made that clear. Um, and what they preached constantly was, don't focus on what life is like today focus on what it might become during your lifetime. Wow. So prepare yourself not for today, but prepare yourself for that time to come when African Americans would have equal rights, when African Americans would be able to do things that people now said they could not do. So it was their vision, not mine, that I kind of um, relied on. And I take it you wouldn't have gone to Dillard without a scholarship? You got a scholarship to college. How, how critical was the financial aid to you to go to college? 
Well, I mean, my family was, was uh, as they say, dirt poor. Yeah. Uh, I remember when I first mentioned to my mother the chance that I might go to college because my teacher had said, you know, Ruth, you might be able to go to college one day. So I went home and I said, um, you know, do you think I might be able to go to college? And my mother's, the look on her face told me everything. Yes. That uh, she did not think that that <laughs> would ever be possible. Uh, but being a wonderful mother, she didn't say absolutely not. She said, well, we'll see, we'll see. And, um, and, and fortunately, uh, it, when, when I um, managed to get admitted to college, I asked my father, I said, my mother had died by then, I asked my father, may I go to college? Um, I have a scholarship. And he said, yes, but only as long as it doesn't cost me one red cent. Because you see, he didn't have that red cent right. to give me to go to college. So I knew that going off to college, I was going absolutely without any uh, help from my, from my father. Um, and I don't know why I had it in me to do that, um, in spite of the fact that I knew I would have no money, mm -hmm. but partly, again, back to teachers. So right before I had to get ready to go to college, um, a, a teacher from my high school called me and said, I, I need you to come over to my, my house and help me with some chores. And, uh, and so I uh, went to her house, and then what she did was the most miraculous thing. Uh, she sent me to her closet and had me pick out clothes from her closet for me to be able to have clothes to take to college. Wow, oh my. Because she knew, she knew. Well, they all knew that I didn't have anything. And so, so I went to college with my teacher's clothes. Unbelievable. Yeah. So given those experiences, and then eventually you went to Harvard for your master's and then for your PhD, did you know then that you were going to become an educator or did that come later? I, I came very late to knowing um, what I wanted to do. For the longest, I just kind of dwelled in the realm of relishing everything that was so great about education. I just couldn't believe my good fortune mm -hmm. to be able to learn and learn and learn some more, to be able to open up the world that had been so closed for me as a child. Uh, that was miraculous to me, and I just wanted to do that. And so when I got to college, uh, I knew by then, I knew the lie, the big lie was a big lie. The big lie about blacks being inferior, right. about blacks never being able to accomplish very much. Um, and so forth. I knew that was a lie by then. And so I wanted to put a nail in that coffin, decidedly. And so I just pursued every avenue to learn. Yes. So when I was 17, I got on a bus and went to Mexico alone on a Greyhound bus um, to study Spanish and to live with a Mexican family. Because I had to see something other than the country that I grew up in yep. and that told me I was worthless. So I went to Mexico. Then I decided that, well, uh, learning about other cultures, how miraculous is that? I can now, again, put to rest this whole myth of worthiness of one group uh, or another. And so then I went off to France um, and, uh, and uh, spent time in France. And so I was on a tear. And then I studied languages because I knew this was the key. I needed to learn about other people. Yeah. I needed to find out why it is that we feel as we do about certain groups and how we can demystify that and destroy it definitively and make the world a better place. So I was very idealistic. And it was not until, and so I ended up in graduate school basically because um, my grades were such that I just kept getting awards and I got two fellowships yes. and that would send me anywhere I wanted to go for graduate school uh, free. And so um, I wanted to go to Yale, but Yale rejected me. And so I ended up Settled at Harvard. For Harvard yeah. yeah. And, and so, so I went to Harvard basically because I had the money to go from yeah. fellowship. But you clear, you had a passion, real passion, and you followed that passion yes. for languages. It was a good lesson in that. You, you, you went as far as that passion took, and then you decided that you're going to teach. Yes. And, went to, and, and I'm going to speed through your life 
uh, a little bit too, in the interest of time, because we don't have a choice here today. Um, uh, you took a number of teaching positions, which led ultimately uh, to Smith College initially in 1995. Did, did you think through that academic career that you're eventually going to be president of a university? No, I thought just the opposite. You figured you would be a professor and that would be uh, it? I thought I would never uh, rise to a level of any prominence in university life. And why? And what changed um, that? I thought because I thought the world was not ready for me, first of all, uh, because I was very outspoken. I see. And what kept me in university life was the conviction that universities needed to be changed. And that um, I, my contribution to university life was going to be to demonstrate the ways in which the elitism and the exclusionary practices of universities were harming the country yeah. um, and different groups. And so that was my path within university life. And it didn't hurt and, your career at all. It, it sounds like it well, sped it I, along. I think something strange happened. I, I guess they didn't get it for some reason. Or maybe but, they liked but, it. Uh, or maybe it, it proved in the end to be beneficial because just as I was um, going uh, to be president of Smith, people were just coming to terms with diversity right. and thinking, oh, well, maybe there's something there and maybe we need to do more uh, to have a fairer society. And that has to be bringing people from the margins into the center um, and learning how to deal with this experiment that we have in this country, a multi, truly multicultural, multiracial nation. Right. that has to work together uh, to accomplish anything. And people were very interested in that. And so I guess that's why. And it fit authentic, very authentically with your vision. It, it did. If, if, it, if there had been another idea, yeah. uh, if somebody said to me, well, you know, we really want you to go off and, um, and really emphasize these kinds of theories and be this kind of president, I right. would have said no. Right. Uh, in fact, when Smith came to me and asked me to become president, I told them they had the wrong person. Yeah. Because I didn't believe they understood who I was. Okay. Um, and I wanted to make sure that they would not have me be someone I could not be. And so I said, I am not the person you think I am. Therefore, you need to think hard about whether or not I'm the right person because I'm not. I'm not Barbara Bush. I'm not Gloria Steinem. And what did they say? I'm not. They said they, they thought they knew who I was. <laughs> they checked you out. Uh, they had checked me out, and, uh, and so they insisted, and so that's how I became president. So we're going to speed through the six years at Smith, and then you go, and I remember when this happened, you and I were talking earlier, it, it got a lot of attention that you moved from Smith to become president of an Ivy League school, great Ivy League school, Brown, uh, which was groundbreaking in a whole number of ways, as we talked about earlier, and you did that job for many years. Uh, including through a financial crisis, yeah. changes in tone in this country, uh, t a lot of tension. Uh, what were your biggest challenges moving to a quote unquote Ivy League school and running Brown for all those years? What were some of the big challenges you faced? Well, first let me say personally, um, when you're the first of your group to perform, especially in, so if, if you've been almost 300 years, and no one of your group has ever acceded to that post, yeah. the first thing you worry about is embarrassing um, your group, right. okay? And, right. and, the, and the fact that if you fail, um, there probably won't be anybody coming after you. That's a big so, burden. So that is the, that's the first big thing, and so you, you don't want to do it initially because that pressure seems to be yeah. um, uh, inordinately high. Um, so on a personal level, uh, uh, I didn't want to be separated from my family. I didn't want to be separated from African Americans yeah. um, because I didn't see how I could make it as a person if people in my community could not look to me and trust me and respect me. I just didn't see how that could work for me. Okay. And so I worried about how people would view my leadership in and that And why role. would going to 
Brown separate you from your community? Because um, in the Ivies, you're in the most the most elite of the elite in Got this it. country. So you're naturally separated. And so you're naturally separated because um, without even portraying that, people can think you think so much of yourself. Got it. Um, because they're projecting things on you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, because uh, after all, um, you're president of an Ivy League university, and you're not going to think anything of us. And my family at that time, remember I'm from a working class family and everybody is still working class. And so the gap between what people are talking about theoretically mm -hmm. at an Ivy University and the wealth um, in that environment and then my family right. still um, just struggling to make a living yep. uh, and so forth and just psychologically Pretty jarring. Uh, working through that, mm -hmm. and I think for a long time I did it by just not letting people know uh, uh, what was really the reality yeah. uh, of my position um, as president of Brown. And so I'd have tea with the the um, putative um, king of Greece, um, uh, Constantine, who died recently, and have a perfectly normal conversation with him at tea and then not be able to tell anybody uh, about the fact that I was um, meeting with presidents of the United States and kings and queens and so forth. And I, I just didn't talk about the experiences because I didn't know how to bridge that gap. Um, so, so that was the personal part of it. The, uh, the other part of it was just the, mag the, the breadth of it. Yep. And so when you're a university president, you've got everything. You've got finances. You've got um, uh, uh, personnel issues. Um, you've got um, to deal with the policies of the country. You've got to deal with uh, constituents. And when you are a university that's 250 years old, I mean, Prairie View um, has 70,000 yeah. alumni. But if you're 250 years old, yeah. you, you have a lot of history. And when you're appointed as president and people don't see themselves in you, um, then you're, you know, you're dealing with a constituency that has every reason to say, why are you here and why are you representing me? I don't know who you are. And I remember when I first got to Brown, the faculty were very worried because I was from Texas. And I thought it was all about race, but they were worried because I yeah. was from Texas. Yeah. Um, so, you know, they, we always identify people with particularities of their situation. Yeah. Um, rather than holistically yeah. trying put it, we'd to. We'd like to put them in a box. We do, in fact. And so, uh, but, but I overcame that. Who helped you? Who coached you, mentored you? What either personal, professional relationships that helped pull you through those isolating, those periods where you felt isolated? Well, I mean, I would say coming along gradually, I encountered people who did the most important thing for me, and that is not coddle me, uh, not tell me things that I thought were, I wanted to hear, yeah. but uh, tried earnestly to give me input that mattered. And I'll never forget um, uh, a dean at Princeton, um, Aaron Lemonick, yeah. who uh, told me that the work I did was the worst thing he'd ever seen. And I just really, it was horrible and I needed to improve. Yeah. And he is, I always credit him as being the person responsible for my becoming a president. Yeah. Because I learned to take criticism. I learned to improve on what I was doing. And he cared enough to, uh, to be to, blunt with you. Well, he was, he was, he was he very, made, he was so blunt <laughs> that he not only told me that, but he kicked the file cabinet to emphasize how oh, disgusted he okay. was with my work. That may have been too much then, okay. So I went, you know, I, I went back and I cried at my desk and I got up and redid it. How important is it though in that position, they say lonely at the top. Yeah. How important is it in that kind of position, it's groundbreaking, you don't have role models to look at. How important is it to have relationships and how, how much did you do to cultivate outside relationships to sort of allow you to be comfortable through that period? It was very hard for me to do because honestly at that time, one of the reasons that the news of my becoming president of Smith was written up on the front page of the New York Times yeah. is because there, I didn't have any colleagues. Yeah. There were no African-American colleagues that I could talk to 
who yeah. were doing what I was doing. Yeah. Um, and so, uh, so what I relied on rather was just trying to uh, nourish myself uh, with the fundamentals that I learned as, as a child. Okay, remember my mother's advice to me, you're, don't ever think you're better than anybody else. Yeah. And so uh, wherever I could find wisdom, uh, it could be the person who was cleaning a, um, a, a space in the building. Yeah. Um, it could be somebody uh, from, the, from the neighborhood that the university was in. It could be, and, and those people often gravitated toward me and they would be the ones who would say, you know, um, you, know you might wanna think about this. So I always say to my students, don't ever think you know who will influence you most in life. So respect every person you encounter because that person that has come across your path could be the most important encounter that you have in your life. Right. And so treasure everything that you can take from those encounters. And it sounds like you were very open to advice and sought it out? Yes, I sought it out, but I didn't follow it. <laughs> you followed it, it resonated, I gather. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I've always been one to, uh, to want to have advice, but never one to be a slave to it. Okay. Um, because uh, I know myself better than uh, anybody else. Uh, I know what motivates me. I know what I want to be in life. And so I hold that in deep respect. Right. But I also want to make sure that I'm listening and hearing from people and caring about people and fitting into the world yeah. uh, in a responsible way. So we're going to leave Providence. We're going to take a few years. And then in 2017, back to Texas. Back to Texas. Through the thunk it. And you took over Prairie View. How hard was that decision, uh, and what caused you to take this job and come here? Um, I, was, I was retiring and looking forward to retiring. And, um, but I was approached about um, the fact that Prairie View didn't have a president, could I serve temporarily? And uh, when I was first, when the notion was first introduced, I sort of laughed, but I laughed because I was thinking to myself, are you kidding? I've been through two presidencies. I'm exhausted. <laughs> I am never going to do another president. In fact, I had turned down a presidency in California. So, um, so I was convinced I was not going to do it. And then they did the clever thing and they brought me to campus. And so here I am on campus, um, uh, really um, anonymously on campus, and I'm seeing the students walking across the campus and it strikes me immediately that's me yeah that's me and it it says to me of course i need to be here to yeah. help because what has my life been like all these years learning yeah. to do what i've learned to do if i'm not prepared right now back in texas to repay all those teachers all those people who helped me when i was a kid what am I worth if I say no? And it took, and so the, vi it took I, the visit and yeah, seeing these yeah, students yeah. here yeah. for that to hit you. Well, I mean, and, and some pressure from my brother. And who, from pressure from yeah, your brother yeah, who lived down here? Yeah. Well, well he, he went to Prairie View. All right, so let's, let's roll forward to the last number of years here at Prairie View. Uh, you and I have talked about, and I think you've said to me before, you said it today earlier, and they've said it before, people don't really understand what it means to, to not have enough money, poverty. What are some of the challenges that a typical student at Prairie View faces that I think people listening may not, may not be as uh, familiar with? What's the reality that the students here are dealing with? Well, I mean, it's not all students, but uh, many of our students, uh, here's, here, it's critical to know that um, what is meaningful at Prairie View to the alumni of Prairie View and everybody who loves this institution is that we are a place for those students, okay? For first generation students, yeah. for students who are going to have to struggle yes. to go to college, that we are a place for that is, I, I can't even express how meaningful that is 
yeah. to this institution given its legacy. Yeah. Okay. Um, because it is such a perfect match for how Prairie View came into being mm -hmm. when blacks were not supposed to be educable, when blacks were not supposed to be um, to have any rights whatsoever. This this was a place made for blacks at it right after uh, Reconstruction, um, and for us to be less than. Made for us, yes, but for us to be less than. So to be a part of continuing to be that path for people, that's important. So ha having said that, I will say many of our students, we have a very uh, high number of Pell eligible students yeah. at Prairie View. Pell now, when grants you, for when those you are Pell, yeah. uh, uh, Pell, When you have Pell grants, um, that means that um, that you, in all likelihood, you cannot pay the tuition right. at a place like Brave. You have financial need. You have high financial need. Yeah. And that means, for if you have fi high financial need, that means that there are going to be all kinds of things that you will never be able to do. Yeah. Ever. Um, and that means that you don't have the um, uh, the income uh, to be able to do special things like many college students. Right. I don't know. Did you go on skiing trips when you were in college? I don't no, want to I put was, you on the I spot. was broke in college. I went you to Kansas. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, you were broke. Good. Yeah. So, so, so for, for many students who are middle class and upper, yeah. uh, they go to college and they have all kinds of extravagant things that they're able to do. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, but typically students here need more help because their families may not be able to provide that. Right. And, um, and so, uh, so for us, financial aid on top of that is very important. Emergency grants right. are very important because sometimes you need $200 just to get through the year, yeah. um, and you don't have it. There's no place you can go to you, get $200. You've also explained to me that just because you go to college doesn't mean you're disconnected from your family. If your family can't make ends meet right. and can't get enough to eat, then the money you're using for college may well... Have to go to the family. Yeah, it's, and yeah. so all of a sudden you have a student who's struggling to finish right. here because of the needs of the family. Right. Doing right. everything right themselves, but their family right. is in financial so how do, distress. How do, you, well, how, do you, how do you live with that if you are a family member and your mom uh, is, you know, calls you and says, you know, I can't make rent this month. What are you supposed to do as a student living on a campus with all your meals covered yeah. and being reasonably comfortable? Yeah, you you think it's okay for, for, for them to feel uh, different from where their family is? I don't, I, I think most, I had trouble like that when I was a student. Yeah. Uh, and I think, I, I, I think the, the normal person will find that a challenge. So you and I have talked about it in the United States, and these are not great numbers. For the whole population, I think the average graduation rate is a little under 50%, about 48%. For blacks in this country, I think it's 27 or 28%. Uh, why is it so low? How much does it have to do with readiness or financial, uh, financial uh, resources? What are you learning about that having been here at Prairie View? Well, I mean, I think it's a great combination of things. So, so I often give this example for people to understand because they love to say, well, you know, of course, that the completion rate at Harvard is 99.9%. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so here's what I can tell you about that. Yeah. Um, uh, the students that I've had in wealthy institutions um, never get lost. They never have a need that isn't met. Right. They never get uh, overlooked. I remember when I was at Princeton, I had a student who was very unhappy and who left school uh, for Thanksgiving and didn't come back. And then um, I learned that he hadn't come back. And I called his house and found him. And I said, you come back here immediately. You get on a plane tomorrow. I'm going to talk to your professors and make sure it's OK. Hmm. But you get back here. And, and, and finish. Wow. Um, and that's what you do with every individual student. They call that wraparound attention. Mm -hmm. That's what you get in wealthy institutions. Right. And so, um, uh, so having uh, students with financial problems, with personal issues, um, with families, uh, worries about of all kinds, why should they have a high graduation rate? They're just like everybody else in life. So how do you deal with that here? Well, we have a number of different things. Uh, we've had uh, an infusion of funds for 
uh, financial aid, thank, thank God, and we've been mm -hmm. able to give more financial aid uh, scholarships. But we also have had more emergency funds. Mm -hmm. um, and I like emergency funds because I, I think you never have a moment when you say, oh my God, I don't know what I'm going to do. I'm out of money and I don't have a way to eat this month. You don't, you don't have that situation. Right. But, um, but it's possible for students to run, encounter a period where they just cannot eat and they cannot do what they need to do. And so emergency funds are very important. And the students here know there's a place they can go if they're in that situation? There are many places they can go if okay. they're in that situation. Uh, they can go to the president's office, they can go to the dean of students' office, yeah. and so forth, um, uh, to, uh, for emergencies. And, uh, and we try to promote for students the idea that they, they know that it's there for them. For it's not frivolous. Right. but for true emergencies. Sure. I remember a student came once and to say that his family's uh, home had been destroyed. This was during the flood um, and everything was lost yeah. and, uh, and so forth. And you know, you have to do something. I mean, as a society, we have to do something. But when we take responsibility for students who come to us to learn, we have to put them in a position where they have the resources to be able to focus on their learning. Okay. And that's, that's what's key. All right, I'm gonna ask you a couple other questions, but while I'm doing this, we may prepare and just get ready online if you have questions. Anybody in the audience has a question, just raise your hand and I'll start in a few minutes. I've got an unlimited number of questions, but if we have those online or in person, we'll, we'll take some of your questions. So let's talk about related to this, one of the things you've also, and I've ta also talked a lot about, is the uh, very uh, challenging statistics about early childhood literacy, childhood poverty. I live in Dallas, one in four kids in Dallas, yeah. rich city, grow up in poverty. Um, and, bec and related to that, a uh, meaningful percentage of black and Hispanic students are, are getting to first and third grade where they're behind grade level. And I know there's been a lot done on early childhood literacy and digital divide and all that. What, what, in your view, what needs to be done? Um, is this something we should accept? Is it, is, is, what are the things that need to be done to address these issues? Because this obviously is the workforce of the future and you're educating the workforce of the future here at Prairie View. Well, first of all, uh, I don't know why we don't give, uh, make it a right of every child to have early uh, education, yeah, we're starting too late. Yep, that's number one. Right. Um, and so, if um, you know, other countries do it, yes. uh, and we uh, are uh, wealthy as a nation, why we we don't do it is uh, very uh, strange to me. Should this but, be done locally, at the state, federal? Um, when How do we do it? when Horace Mann decided um, uh, it, that um, Massachusetts should have a um, pu um, mandatory public education available to all, yeah. and that swept across the country, and now we have mandatory education, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, we could make mandatory education for much earlier in a child's life. Yes. That does a number of different things, because, you know, if you know... Um, uh, a child's um, cognitive uh, development begins from the time they're born. And it turns out that how parents behave when children are infants has a good deal to do with how they develop, how their minds develop. And so, uh, and so um, the earlier you can get to a child um, to expose them to learning, the better. Now, when I was, um, until I was six years old, I never had a book. I didn't have writing utensils um, because um, my family didn't have the means to have any of that, and we certainly didn't have any media. Um, and so that's why, you know, when I got to school and discovered there were all these wonderful things, I was so shocked because I'd never seen them before. Yeah. Well, um, you can overcome that uh, later on, but it's much better 
if you introduce children to it at the earliest possible opportunity. I'd like to see a mandate, a national mandate yeah. for early education. Yeah, I agree with you. And you, if you, you know, there will be a lot of people who don't want the government touching their children yeah. uh, before a certain age. That's fine. It's too late, But though. for those who need, who need it, yeah. and those would include people who cannot afford good child care, for example, um, for them to be able to have their child in, um, in early education would be immense. And now some communities have started to do that. Yes, they have. Uh, on their own. And, you know, kudos to them for that. But I think that was, that's the single most important thing we could do Good. to prepare students for the education they need to have access to. Now, one of the things you've looked at, I know, the whole educational ecosystem, early childhood literacy, secondary education, skills training, and even if you go to college, get a more technical degree, you, has, you as a result have beefed up your engineering school or created an engineering school and beefed up engineering. Could you talk a little bit about why you did that? It was a groundbreaking, is a groundbreaking well, effort. Well, I did, I did that at Smith when there was no engineering. Oh, my. Yeah. Uh, because... Uh, because um, Access to engineering and to technical careers at that time uh, basically were pre preserved uh, to, uh, for uh, white males. Right. Uh, women were not welcome to engineering at that time, um, and very few blacks succeeded in engineering professions at that time. So, so one of the things that I, I've been very uh, passionate about is opening up uh, technology to all of these groups because you don't have to be a genius to see that's where the world is going, yeah. okay? So, um, so today we're driving around in automobiles. Soon we won't drive at all right? Uh, because there will be autonomous um, uh, driving. Yep. Um, today uh, we are, you know, struggling with our handheld um, devices. Um, in the future, um, we are not going to have these crude implements um, at all. We're going to have something much more sophisticated. So the world ahead is going to be governed by technology. And if we are left out of it, guess what we become? First of all, the design of technology does not include us and our values. Right. Okay. Um, uh, secondly, uh, whatever there is to be done in terms of uh, technology, uh, governing te technology, that's going to be a problem because we're not a part of that either, of that decision-making right. process. Right. And so I think it's very, I was looking yesterday at a very sophisticated robot has, that has now been developed. And um, it's very odd to me. I, I, you know, I shouldn't say this, but that robot has very um, soulful uh, movements. Do you understand what I'm saying? I do understand okay, what you're so, saying. So, As someone so, who has trouble moving, yeah, I do understand so, what you're but, saying. But, but I, it, you know, but there are things that um, that um, <laughs> come out of our culture, yeah. out of our uh, sensibilities that shape the direction that the world is taking. Yes. And from my, I mean, from my perspective, I think everybody has to have ownership of that and feel that they are part of it. Yep. So that when these things emerge, um, it's not foreign to us. Yep. Uh, we're not visitors and so on. So, All right. yeah. We're going to take a couple of questions from the audience, and I'll turn, turn to you, Jim. Where do we go next? We have a question right at the front here. Fire away. Okay. I, I admire your life. I just think you walk on water. <laughs> not at all. But I was wondering, during your lifetime, um, has there ever been anything that you failed at? And if so, what did you learn from that, and how did you use that failure to propel onto more successes? Uh, thank you. You're very generous. But uh, I, have fa I have failed many times. First of all, uh, I was uh, insufferable as a young person. <laughs> Everybody agreed. Um, and I was uh, not a nice person at all. Um, I was merely tolerated by my family, and most of the time in school I was barely tolerated. Uh, I was thought to be a kind of a, a, a weird person, okay, when I was young. Uh, and even early in my career, I was shunned a good deal uh, early in my career. 
because I, you might notice I have a mouth and I express my opinion rather freely. And um, as I got started in my career, everybody just kept away from me because they did not want to hear from me <laughs> about uh, my observations. Most of my observations were about the weaknesses in our system, the absence of minorities, oh. uh, the disrespect people have for certain groups, um, the closed perspective that we have when we should have an open perspective as educators. And I would talk about this incessantly and people just couldn't stand it, okay? Um, so what I did, I did finally notice that nobody would listen to me. Um, and I decided that I needed to do some work on myself. Hmm. Um, and so um, I decided, um, I, could, I remember vividly the, the moment when I decided that this was a critical factor in what I'd be able to do in my life. And I decided I needed to just shut up. Just shut up, okay? Um, because it was not my job to tell everybody what they should be doing. It was my job to do what I could to convince others to take up that battle, um, but to do it in a way that allowed them to have agency, not to dictate to them what they should be doing, but rather to invite them into a world that I loved because I just thought it was wonderful to love other people. I thought it was wonderful to be open to uh, different groups of people. I thought it was wonderful to help, help people in a certain way. And I wanted them to feel the magic of that. And so I started working on, well, how can I get them to feel that way and see how exciting it is when you accomplish something like that. And so I started working on that and I got you know, better and better at it. And eventually I noticed that it worked a lot better for me. I've made very bad decisions uh, often in my leadership role. Um, and I've had to figure out how to acknowledge bad decisions and um, move away from bad decisions that I've, that I've made. Um, and um, it's very important in a leadership role not to try, not to think you're perfect and not to try to be perfect. Um, it's very important instead to just be who you are and invite people into that. This is who I am, this is the way I think. Sometimes I may be right, sometimes I may be wrong, uh, but here's my motivation. And let people judge you for that. And so I learned, to, I learned eventually to do that and it was, you know, it was much better for me when I learned that. But, but really, you know, I was horrible as a, as a young person. I, I really was. I remember I was, um, uh, 60 Minutes did a piece on me and um, when I was, uh, became president of Smith. And so Morley Safer came down to Houston to interview my family. And so um, he sat around and he asked my siblings uh, about me. And oh, it was, it was horrible <laughs> because they said the worst things about me. Okay, about how hor it was all about how horrible I was, <laughs> honestly. Um, so, so education can lead you to be arrogant. Um, and I was so enthralled with what I was learning that I used that as a weapon because I was t powerless at the time and it was very easy for me to use my knowledge as a weapon against other people. Um, and that was so wrong to do and it was not a very good strategy uh, for accomplishing Great everything. Story. So, uh, so I, so I, I modified that. Thank God, <laughs> and 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 I, I do a lot better today than than then. Let's take one other here. Thank you for sharing with us this afternoon. If you had to speak to the eighteen-year-old Ruth, what advice would you give her? Uh, well, when I was eighteen. Um, you know, I, I worried a lot about whether I could ever do anything that was meaningful, uh, frankly. It was before the gains of the civil rights struggle. It was before I had experienced more of the world. And um, I saw myself as being a bit of a cog uh, in a, you know, giant machine. 
I think what I would say is don't worry, and I, this is what I tell my students today. Students come in, they say, well, you know, Ruth, I want to do this, this, this is what I want to accomplish. And the first thing I tell them is forget about that. Don't worry about that, okay? Let life happen. The only thing you have to worry about is working hard, being considerate of others, respecting yourself and others, and being open to opportunities that come to you. Um, and that's all you need to worry about. That's what I tell my 18-year-old self. Don't worry. Just do the work, as hard, work as hard as you can, um, and just keep moving. And honestly, uh, I, I would say I'm more surprised probably than anybody else at what my life has been because it's been a great, it has been a great surprise to me and every day it still is a, a great surprise to me. To be able, imagine, to be able to do the thing that you love every day, I mean, honestly. I understand my first grade teacher now because I couldn't understand how she could come into that classroom every day and just think the world was beautiful and all of us were beautiful. You know, I couldn't understand, but I understand it now because I can come to work every day and feel that mm -hmm. I'm the luckiest person in the world to be able to do the work that I do on behalf of these students. So let me ask one follow-up to that. Many people listening to this and who will listen to this broadcast are thinking about becoming teachers, but they're worried about the compensation. They've heard that a lot of teachers have quit post-COVID. Uh, what would be your pitch, for lack of a better term, to those that are thinking about being teachers, why that is a path they ought to really seriously consider? I guess the reason that, the most important reason is that, you know, as I look back on my uh, career, is there the tens of thousands of students that I've influenced. Yeah. There is no job hmm. and no pay that is equal to the satisfaction you will derive from that. There's nothing like it. And so um, encountering, I mean, encountering people who want to bring their children to meet you because you said something once that you don't even remember that made something happen for them in their life, okay? Um, and that's true for anybody, no matter what profession you are, because most of us influence people whether we are trying to do it or not. And so you always want to be respectful of the fact that you have that impact on others and teachers more than any other group that I can think of. That's great. That's great. Beautiful. All right, let's hear one other. Um, hello. Good afternoon. My name is Adia Larzea. <clears throat> um, I'm a business manager major at PV, and my question is, what was your bond like with your siblings before you went off to college, and by any chance did that chase, uh, change? Um, I didn't hear the first part. What was the what? Was the what? what was your bond like with your siblings oh. pre and post? Oh, pre and is post. Is that fair? So um, I'm the youngest uh, of 12 children. Uh, my family is too close. Okay, we are, we are bonded beyond anything that you can imagine, very close. And that's probably one of the reasons that I was so fearful in my career of being separated from them because that closeness was something that had marked my life, uh, all of my life, frankly. Um, uh, and today, I would say we are closer than ever. I did something for my siblings. I, I've always thought, I, felt, I still feel guilty that I have done so much better uh, uh, than they. And so I was thinking recently, well, what could I do to show them how much I love and appreciate them? So I decided to buy cars for all of my siblings. Cars. Yeah. Automobiles. Yeah. Yeah. And so, <laughs> and so I, I, that's what I did. Yeah. I, I, bought, I bought them all, each, a, I think it was Nothing says I seven love or you eight like a car. car. Yeah, seven or eight cars. <laughs> um, and uh, I thought, now they understand that I don't think I'm better, <laughs> that I just, I just treasure them. Uh, but then they said, well, what else are you going to do for us? <laughs> so it's never, it's never really enough. But, but um, we are very close. Uh, I'm clo I'm, I am closer to my siblings, uh, of course, 
today than I, than I ever was um, uh, when I was young, and that's hard to believe, but I, I am. And, but, I, but I've cultivated that because it's important to me. And so if you treasure your friendships and your relationships with people, you have to put work into it, okay? You do. You cannot take it for granted. So I hope I've never taken that for granted. So we've got just a few minutes left. Let me ask you a final question, and we'll okay. turn it over to Jim. We've got, listening to this, I think over time we have students, uh, we have community leaders, we have business leaders. The one thing they probably have in common, uh, they're interested in the community, they want to make a positive difference in the world. From where you sit, you've made an enormous difference in so many different ways. What advice would you give to those listening about an action they could take that could make a positive difference in their community or their state or in the country? Well, of course, the most important thing is to do something. Um, not to think about it endlessly, not to think about whether it's this thing or that thing, but choose uh, an area and a focus and just go and do it, and do it with passion, and do it with purpose. And um, the only other thing I'd say is every single person in this country has to care about the least of us. You have to care about that child uh, who is uh, the poorest of the poor with no chance in life. If your heart is there and you care about that child, you're going to know what to do, believe me. Right. But you have to care about that child. If you're somebody who says, well, I know I have mine and you know, they, they, they've got to get theirs and if they don't get it, they're just lazy. If you're that kind of person, Forget it. It doesn't matter what you're going to do. You're probably not going to have the impact you need to have. But in the end, um, you know, I said something in that trial when I was testifying in, in the trial that I told you about yeah. uh, that uh, seemed the most important thing to me, and it still is, and that is what are we going to be as a country if we don't care about each other? What, what's going to happen to this country? Yeah. Uh, what's going to happen if people are not included in this project? What's going to happen if we show contempt for others instead of concern and respect for them? There is just no way that I can see a good outcome for the kind of um, animus that exists in society. But one way to get rid of that, an easy way to get rid of it, is just start caring about the children right okay they haven't done anything to deserve your <laughs> contempt yeah. they've done nothing to deserve your hatred just care about them and then if you start caring about children it can build from there and you can think about things to do that will be meaningful to keep this country from destroying itself all right beautiful yeah. advice Ruth Simmons thank you for your service thank you for thank your you. leadership and thank you uh, for all you've done here at Prairie View in your entire career. And we love, of course, everything you do with Draper Richards Kaplan. And with that, let me turn it over to Jim Bilder. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for watching the first of these perspective series. And Ruth, you know, you are so perfect for this first series and you're so perfect for the world we're living in. When Rob and I talked about, you know, why would we do a perspective series? It's because the world is in short supply of hope. And too many people say routinely, I'll believe it when I see it. And you are an example of someone who believed it and can be it. And that is just an extraordinary talent. So thank you for, for being who you are. And in a world with not enough gratitude, just know that we have enormous gratitude for what you've accomplished and the model you are and the person you are. So thank you so much. And thanks, Rob, for facilitating this. And uh, thank you, Prairie View a and for all of the work and the production to make this possible. And a final note, this episode will be available on demand and on the Draper Richards Kaplan LinkedIn page if you'd like to watch or share it. Good evening, and thank you very much. Swan, the